Not good morning, not welcome. Margaret, you have to record. Good morning and welcome to Ecclesia Baptist. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us on this fourth Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of love. If we were meeting face to face, there would be a, a Christmas tree behind me, not beside me. And our children would come forward bringing the cross that they would sit right in front of me here and a candle, which they would very carefully after having chosen who got to light it this Sunday, they would light it. And one of them, probably Keziah, because she's the tallest, would put my stole from uh, Matanzas, Cuba, around my neck. And we would turn to you and say, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you, let us worship God. I put the wrong hymn for the first hymn, so I hope that you adjusted to that. I think it's probably on about the same page in the hymnal if you have your hymnal pulled up, so I hope that uh, that didn't throw anybody off. It is time now to light our Advent wreath. We start with um, lighting the candle of hope for our first Sunday of Advent. The second Sunday of Advent was the Advent Sunday of Peace. Last week, we lit the pink candle, the candle of joy.
And today, just days before Christmas, we light the fourth Advent candle, the candle of love, as we watch this video. Reading from Psalm 89, I invite you to follow along as we hear this psalm of love, a love song to God. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to my servant, David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. And continuing in verse 16. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord and our King to the Holy One of Israel. When you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. 
I have found my servant David. With my oil, I have anointed him. My hand shall always re remain with him. My arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come now to our time of prayers of the people, I want to lift up particularly today the church, the First Baptist Church of Hendersonville, North Carolina. Um, they made uh, the choice to have their Christmas concert in person. And as a result, um, since that concert on Sunday of last week, now 75 people have been diagnosed with COVID. I think we can agree that they probably regret that choice. So I, I think we probably don't even need to like remind them even in our own heads that that probably wasn't a good choice. Instead, I think as people of God join together, we can pray for them as they struggle with the consequences of this choice and with their congregation who is so now infirmed by this virus. Also lifting up all the others who have been um, isolated by COVID. I, I got to uh, visit this week with Nina. And uh, when I left, I, I said to her daughter, Tara, we visited together on Friday afternoon um, that, that I just wanted to go home and cry <laughs> because um, Nina seems so lonely and it's so cold to visit outside and you can't visit inside. And I know there aren't any easy answers, but it is a very hard time. Um, once while I was there, Nina turned to Tara and sort of gestured toward me and said, I miss seeing her. It just reminds me of how important our visits are and our notes and our cards. Let's don't forget the forgotten ones whose isolation is made so much more pronounced by this pandemic. Uh, our daughter and her boyfriend are in England where the virus has kicked up a notch with a new strain. I thank you for your prayers and your questions about her. Um, they did not have any plans to leave. Uh, they're, they're in Oxfordshire and Wallingford and they didn't have any plans to go to London or leave really their home, um, uh, his home, his parents' home while they're there. So as far as we know, they're safe. Whether or not they can get back is another question, but thank you for your concern for her. We feel confident that um, they, make, they will make the best decisions they can and will stay safe. In addition to all of that, I ask that you lift up the, um, those who are listed on our prayer list. I hope that each week when you receive the newsletter that you read through those names and prayerfully remember each one of those individuals. Each week I highlight ones that I have updated or um, new update, new people or ones that we just haven't maybe mentioned in a while. And so I invite you to use that list as your prayer guide through the week. Now then, if you will come with me to the throne of grace as we pray together. Oh God, what a joy it is to worship you. Our hearts overflow with the knowledge that you sent your son, you put on flesh, so that you could love us better, that you could know us better. Oh God, for this immeasurable gift, we give you our thanks. We thank you, God, for the traditions that surround this holiday and ask for your forgiveness for the times when we think the traditions more important than the purpose of celebrating. We thank you for Advent that's truly 
a sacred time. And we ask your forgiveness for the times we get distracted by the so-called demands of the season. Turn us back to the manger. Turn us back to those in first century Nazareth who were changed by the incoming of God made flesh. Oh God, we thank you for the peace that we have in our nation, in our homes, and in our lives, and for the times when we experience chaos and unrest, we ask that you would provide to us everlasting peace, that you would give us the hope of Advent that promises new life, even in times of darkness, the hope that promises blinding light. Oh God, we thank you for the joy that you have given us. And we ask that you would let that joy bubble up within us, especially when we feel ourselves overcome by distress. Let that joy that you have planted within us stir a new feeling, a feeling that overcomes the minutia that we become distracted by. And oh God, we thank you for the love that you created in your son, Jesus Christ. And it is to your son that we pray as we lift up those whose names weigh heavy on our heart, asking Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Boyce and Jean Earnhardt. Chuck and Nancy Price. Chuck and Barbara Butcher and Emma Jason and her family. Mary Allen Leah. And Renee. Eileen Cole, David Gibbs. The family of Cindy Limonstall. Debbie and Joe Pace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is time now for the Christmas, for the, for the children's story. And this is a story that I read right after, I think it may have been the very first book I read to our children once I started at Ecclesia. But it's so good for today that I couldn't resist reading it again. It is called Ordinary Mary's Extraordinary Deed. And it is written by Emily Pearson and illustrated by Fumi Kosaka. That means Emily Pearson, she wrote the words. And Fumi Kasaka, she drew the pictures. They can it together. Ordinary Mary's extraordinary deed. One ordinary day, 
skipping on her way from her ordinary school to her ordinary house. Ordinary Mary passed an ordinary vacant lot filled with ordinary bushes growing ordinary berries. Ordinary blue and juicy, luscious, lovely berries. The one people that she gave blueberry muffins to was Billy Parker. And when Billy saw his name on a note in the driveway on a plate, he quickly parked his bike and ate every crumb. Oh, yum, yum, yum. He ate every crumb. This made him so glad that the next five people got their papers on the porch and not in the bushes where he often threw them. In fact, they were handed right to them. Those five was Mr. Stevens, who was so amazed that he smiled for 10 hours on the airplane, then said to five different people who had heavy bags, here, let me help you. He still smiled and they did too. Those five was Maria, whose cranky little boy James stopped crying when Mr. Stevens played peekaboo with him until their ride came. When he waved goodbye, Maria exclaimed, how strange that a stranger would be so sweet. And the next day when she was out shopping once, twice, five times, she did something nice for five different people, five times without stopping. One of those five was Joseph, old and bent and gray, in front of her in line at the produce stand. When he said, I guess I counted wrong, I don't need these oranges. Little James reached out to him with an orange from their basket and Maria put a coin in Joseph's hand and said, here, take this, the oranges are on us. As Joseph shuffled to the bus, his heart was full and his eyes were wet and his hands did helpful things for the next five people he met. One of those five was Sarah, a college girl who was off to see the world and stopped at Joseph's shop. When her bag broke and her things fell all over the floor, she said, oh, what do I do? Joseph said, this is for you. And he gave her a new bag woven with his own hands in red and purple and green. Oh, thank you, she said. It's the loveliest bag I've ever seen. When Sarah left, she felt sunny as noon and she just had to shine on five people soon. One of those five was Sophia, whom she met on a boat, looking like the world might end, looking like someone without a friend. What beautiful eyes you have, Sarah said, and they're just the color of the flowers in your lovely dress. Yes, said Sophia. Oh, yes, said Sarah. The beautiful blue eyes shed a happy tear. And when the boat trip was through, Sophia called five people to make them happy too. One of those five was Tom, her son, the doctor, who was having a very hard day. Hi, she said, I love you, Tom. Well, I always need my mom, he sighed. Dr. Tom was so cheered up that on his next break, he bought a big bunch of bright balloons for five young patients and he handed them out right then and there. One of those five was Peter, a little boy who went home from the hospital that very day. Gratitude for the big bunch of bright balloons filled him and thrilled him and spilled him onto the next five people who came his way. Those five was Eric, a teenage boy whose sacks and such were way too much. When one dropped on the sidewalk, Peter stopped his play and rushed right over saying, Super Wheels to the rescue. Well, Eric, no longer stressed, was very impressed and made a mental note that that very afternoon, he would help five people and do it soon. One of those five was Di, his 10 year old sister who didn't have many friends and was painfully shy. When Eric said, hey sis, want to come to the park and learn how to ride my skateboard? She looked at him wide-eyed. Serious, she said. Sure, he said. And because of her brother, Di decided maybe she could be a friend to five others.
One of those five was Louise, a homeless woman who lived under the trees. She could hardly believe her ears when Di said, my mom, brother and I buy you a hot dog and a drink at that stand over there. Louise was so pleased that she decided that even though she had nothing, she could find five others and give them something. One of those five was Mr. Taylor, who lost his wallet in the park. Louise found it full of fives and tens and twenties. Oh, what she could do with all that money. But she found his name, called his home, and over he came. He was so impressed that he vowed to do something generous for five people or more. One of those five was Kate, a woman on vacation who wanted to see a show she'd heard was a sensation. Oh no, she said, it's sold out, but I'm going home tomorrow. Mr. Taylor held out his ticket. I live here, he said, I can go anytime. Kate loved the show and was so touched that she thought about, she bought five presents for people back home. And one of those five was a little heart necklace for her niece, Mary. Mary? What? Yes, ordinary Mary's deed had come full circle and on its way it had changed the lives of every person living. You see, when she gave out muffins, not only the paper boy Billy Parker, but the other four people too made five people smile and those five did and those five did. And in only 15 days, love was sent to every person everywhere. Just see how it went. Now, I'm not going to read all those big numbers, but you can see that's a great big, huge number there at the bottom. I think that's six billion something. Well, because Ordinary Mary did an ordinary deed. Well, six billion is even more than all of the people on the planet. So after everyone had a share and everybody knew that somebody cared, there was even more love left over. The world was changed and thousands and millions and billions agreed. It was all because one ordinary day, ordinary Mary did a perfectly ordinary, stunningly earth-shaking, Totally extraordinary deed. The end. Well, I don't know about you, but that makes me so excited to think about how just doing a little few nice things can change the world. Today, we're going to hear about another ordinary Mary and her extraordinary deed. I hope you'll hang around and listen. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for using ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Amen. My sister has uh, graciously asked me to read my favorite piece of the Bible. Um, I thank her because <laughs> it's so hard for me not to talk a lot, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm doing it right now because I'm a little bit nervous, which is weird because I do this every day. But I want to tell you, I have to tell you two Latin things. One, magnify means to make bigger. And two, Spirit comes from the Latin word, which means breathe, like respiration. This is Mary's song of praise. She was visiting another pregnant woman, older than her. This also reminds me of my sister and me. Um, I'm just going to read. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. 
Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown, shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. I have seen many depictions of Mary in churches throughout Europe. Mary receiving the news that she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. When I read this, I'm not quite so scared for Mary because I think she probably gets it, at least on some level. Thanks be to God. Amen. Don't seem like we can do right. Look how we treated you. But please.
they made you be born in a manger. And we didn't know it was you. Well, if that don't take you to church. My, my. I'll be the first to admit that to have Christmas without music is weird. I, I miss the concerts. I miss the caroling. I miss the worship face to face. I miss holding a hymn book and singing the familiar lyrics that harken back to the days of record players and eight track tapes. I miss it. And by the way, eight track tapes, uh, I think many of you will remember those, but for those of you who are a few young years younger than I am, let me explain. An eight track tape is about the thickness of three iPhones stacked together. And if you took an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and folded in, it into fourths, it would be about that size. And you put these massive cassettes into an eight track tape player and you could listen to your songs but you didn't have to listen through the entire thing because the songs were divided into eight tracks and so you could change the track and get to a different song well during the height of the eight track days my family owned a 1972 brand spanking new Chrysler station wagon. That thing <laughs> came equipped with an uh, um, eight track stereo tape player. And we could play all our eight track players right there in the car. It was amazing. Well, one of the times we listened to music the most was uh, my, most Christmases, my family would pile into that car and we would travel to wherever my mother's family was gathering for Christmas. And she would bring along, among other things, eight track tapes. And she would put them in um, as we drove along and we would sing to those songs, songs like All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth, uh, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire, Feliz Navidad, and probably our favorite I ain't getting nothing for Christmas. Mommy and daddy are mad. By the time we got to our destination, we knew the lyrics of those songs so well, we could have sung them backwards. Singing, it, it's always been a part of Christmas. Really, it's always been a part of life, particularly a life of faith. Today's psalm text testifies to the timeless connection between music and worship. It's a psalm Mary herself probably knew. She was a good little Jewish girl who went to synagogue. I can just imagine Mary humming that song to herself as she did her chores or walked to the synagogue. And I, I imagine that young Mary enjoyed those familiar refrains. Listen with me, little Mary. Like other girls her age and station in life, she was probably illiterate, illiterate given the scraps from the table that educated her brothers and their friends. But likely even as a small child, she memorized Psalms. Couldn't go back and reread them. 
So she would have had to listen closely and then commit them to memory, rehearse them in her daily life to reinforce that memory. And as she did, she sang the psalmist words of love that they, she sang of Hesed, a love that is both feeling and action, a love that draws near and holds close, describes a love that fills humanity as water fills a dry sponge. And so doing allows the sponge to be what it was intended to be all along. It's that love that Psalm 89 recounts, that chesed, the love that, that, that fills us, that makes us who we were intended to be. It's that love of God translated often steadfast love or loving kindness that Mary would have sung about when she sung the Psalms. Now remember, Mary wasn't always a pregnant 12 year old girl. At one time, she was a little girl wearing hand-me-down clothes with her hair hanging loose as she went about her daily chores, maybe to get the day's water or to feed the sheep or goats. And as a little girl, I imagine she sang it with the tune that is, comes to us more familiarly in a more familiar language through the message translation. Hear these first four verses. As you imagine Mary, a barefoot six, seven year old, her long hair free from covering. She'll miss some words. She'll get them wrong. She'll mispronounce them, but, but the meaning will be there. Listen to her childlike voice, almost drowned out by the noise of around her of the city moving about. Do you hear her? She sings, your love, God, is my song and I'll sing it. I'm forever telling everyone how faithful you are. I'll never quit telling the story of your love. La, 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 la. How you built the big world and guaranteed everything in it. Da, 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 ba, 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 ba. Your love has always been love. Your love has always been ours. You are faithful too. I bet she doesn't even understand all the words, but she sings on. And as she gets to those latter verses, surely those verses escaped her six-year-old understanding. In the Common English Bible, those verses are translated, I placed a crown on a strong man. I raised up someone especially chosen from the people. I anointed his head with oil. My hand will sustain him. My arm will strengthen him. No enemy will oppress him. No wicked person will make him suffer. My faithfulness and my loyal love will be with him. He will be strengthened by my name. I will set his hand on the sea. I will set his strong hands on the rivers. He will cry out to me. You are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. A familiar refrain and confusing if she starts to think about it, but she does it often, just like we don't when we sing words we know almost too well. I mean, think about our Christmas songs. Frosty the Snowman, Come on, let's run and we'll have some fun before I melt away. That kept me up at night. Jingle bells. The horse was lean and lank. Misfortune seemed his lot. We got into a drifted bank and then we got upset. Uh, yeah. And the one that's to me the most creepy. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. I mean, we sing these songs, but we don't often think about what they actually mean. And I imagine Mary sang some of those songs the same way. But as she did, those songs, those psalms were growing within her. And as she matures into a very young woman, 
Mary hears from Gabriel that she is to be the mother of God's son. By this point, she's engaged to a man who may have been a friend or a colleague, an associate of her father's, around her father's age, probably. Maybe a man from the village who she saw when she was taking, running errands with her mother. She's 12 now, maybe 13. And her skin, it's not as light as it used to be. It's darkened by the sun that she's been in, running and playing. Her complexion was always kind of olive, but now it's a darker brown and her hair is no longer uh, free. It's covered as is custom to women. It's probably not covered with blue silk either, just whatever head covering was available to her. She wasn't wealthy, she wasn't royal, but she's been chosen and it's that that she chooses to focus on in this song she sings to her cousin, Elizabeth. Here, the words that have been growing within her bosom into this song of hope and deliverance. She sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. Wait, what? This is an engaged, unmarried, pregnant girl. Now, girls were pretty much the bottom of the barrel, but a pregnant, unmarried girl? (laughs) She can magnify the Lord? As I think about this word that means make big, grow, make, make larger. That's what magnify means, as you've heard. Magnus, I magnify, make bigger. I thought, you know, when I magnify something, it does look bigger, but mainly it looks closer. When I look in a magnifying glass, the thing comes up close. When I look in a microscope, the thing that is eight inches away is now right at my eye. When I look through reading glasses, if I were to do such a thing, The words are now closer before they were far away. See, our brains don't translate things. Our our brains translate when something's bigger, it means it's closer. That's just the way our brains work. And so when we see, when we look into a magnifying glass and see a spider that's 12 inches away and now it's right here, it feels closer magnifying things makes things make things bigger but it also makes them feel closer mary felt like her her soul her inner being was making god bigger closer and she felt that closeness as she sang on My soul magnifies the Lord in the depths of who I am. I rejoice in God, my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low, low status of his servant. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the mighty one, has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And just like that, and she sang on. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. And that mercy, well, it just brought God closer. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclination. And this unwed mother to be facing a culture that might shun her or even stone her, that news, that just, that pulled God even closer. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. That's me, Mary sang. That's me. And as she sang that song, God came closer. And so she sang on. 
He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty handed. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. And God got so close, God just moved right in so close to Mary, so large to her, that God's presence already literally within her grew to fill her heart and her mind and her soul. She chose to magnify the Lord in the face of the unthinkable, in the face of the worst thing that could happen to the lowliest of beings in first century Nazareth. Mary chose to bring God up close. And it's that example, that very human choice that Mary made, that is ours to follow. God is right here and God wants to come up close. You just need to make that choice. God wants to come up close. Will you let him? It's up to you. Let us pray. Oh God, your love astounds us. Your love fills us. And we celebrate the truth of your word that the least of these will be made whole. We confess, oh God, that too often we face that reality with a passiveness that belies the truth of your power. Oh God, fill us with the love that is you and let each of us come, come to you. Let us come close to worship you and to let you in, that we might be transformed into the very image of your son, Jesus, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You have heard God's word sung. You've heard God's word prayed. You've even heard God's word through a children's story. And you've heard God's word proclaimed. And so I invite you to respond in whatever way God is calling you to do so. Let us sing our final hymn, which I think is, O Come All You Faithful.
It's going to be, what child is this? I'm so glad that you chose to worship with us today. I love having you with us, however you can come. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope today you leave with a song on your heart. And I hope that the lyrics to that song remind you that you are loved. And there is nothing you can do about it. Go in peace to serve God. In Jesus' name. Amen.